All righty. Um, just one moment. Hi, folks. Nick Tockert here with the Historical Fencing Guild. Um, let me just... There we go. Uh, before we get going, I have to pay a few bills. Uh, the Historical Fencing Guild is made possible by uh, a generous support from IndieCD.org. Yes, in the independent creator directory, your one-stop shop for the best and the brightest authors, musicians, flatters. Basically, if you have a dream and you want to make it happen, go to them. We're also made possible by uh, the affiliate link to woodenswords.com. That's Purple Heart Armory for the people in the know. If you are interested in making any purchases, you can, if you go in through this link, uh, I get a small percentage of it. It costs you nothing, but more importantly, it makes it available for me to uh, have a little bit more pull when I request, say, somebody wants this style of trainer, or can you make a longer one of these, or hey, these haven't been in stock for a while, so that we can try to uh, generate what you guys need in an available time in an American company. So that's kind of why we hybrid there. And of course, we are made possible by sales of the Simple Sword, the Fighting Axe, and the Simple Spear. These are part of my ongoing uh, series of books on how to sword fight. So you can go from having never handled the sword to being mar uh, martially proficient with them and being able to teach them. Uh, but most of all, we are made possible by the good folks at the uh, Patreon, the Historical Fencing Guild. These wonderful people who pay as little as a dollar a month allow me to be able to afford trainers and afford to keep the facilities going. And I want to shout them out. That's Off in the Woods, Frog G, Ronald Rain. That's a bladed thesis. He goes by many names. Uh, Brian K. Morris, Cindy Kep, and of course the original, the OG, Mr. Steve Agosto. Um, if you want to join their noble ranks and uh, get access to special things, polls on what's coming out, uh, limited limited videos, early things, go to patreon.com slash the historical fencing guild. All righty. Let me hop the chat to see if there are any questions or commentary. And it looks like we've got some commentary, but nothing much. Oh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, Cindy says, here I am to save the day. And Alex says, dropping my likes then hopping off. We'll, we'll rewatch later to add my notes. But, you know, not feeling the best. Okay, Alec, if you are uh, ill, get some rest. If you have need of me, reach out. I will be here. And feel better sooner. Oh, feel better, feel better. He's here. And turn in, tune into this right here. My ceiling fan is on, and it's actually quite warm in here. So, one moment. That should do. Um. Whew. Sorry, we're at the point where we're trying to adjust the temperatures and get things balanced out. Welcome to the first uh, live stream of 2024. Probably should get talking about what I've been working on and what's going on. Um, relevant to the Historical Fencing Guild, uh, I have been doing some reviews and checking out. Uh, I, I'm looking at items I'm going to review and sorting out my pre-recorded videos. I want to do some uh, custom repair items. I want uh, I want to do some crafting videos. Uh, show you maybe some very rudimentary leather working to get you started. And then I can show, you know, if you, that becomes something you're really interested in, I can do a bit more of it. And I can also recommend some channels for people who are much more advanced. Um, because that's what I do. I get you started. I show you a little bit of what I know. And then I put you towards people who that that's their great passion. Um, but leather working, if you can uh, get a hold of a uh, proper weight of leather, is not nearly as difficult as people think. Uh, there is some minor outlay in tools and you know materials, but it does uh, it is doable and it's it can be much cheaper. Than a lot of alternatives and a lot of the techniques and ideas you get from uh, basic leather working will transfer to um, 
your slightly more advanced styles of armoring. So if you're going to do, say, uh, aluminum, we'll, we'll go with things I've done. Let, you're going to do aluminum bracers attached to some elbow cops uh, to uh, make, you know, either sabatons or an attached cop, elbow cop, which is the cup that goes over your elbow. That, all those hinge joints are most likely going to involve leather for the flexibility of the connection. Now, you can do, there are ways you can do it with very precise, uh, very small uh, rivets and being able to slide it, but that's incredibly advanced compared to where a lot of people are. So um, I want you guys to you know, keep the, in mind that even if the leather working, you're not using the full pieces, the big pieces of leather, understanding connecting leather, sewing leather to, to itself, these little bits can be really helpful later on. We also use leather in uh, assorted um, other aspects of what we do. So let me see if I have, yes, I do. In the near future, I will be either doing a limited live stream where I I don't know if I could stream through uh, uh, Patreon. I know I could do videos to Patreon, but when you're do, dealing with metal on met, metal to absorb some of the impact, you see how this rattles? There's a reason for that. This rattles because in part, it's a little bit loose and in part, there's been damage to both the, I mean, from, from use, the uh, Ricasso spacer, which is right here, and the connections, because whenever you're putting metal against metal, you want to have a leather pad. So I'm going to have to clean this old sword up, probably retape, possibly retip it. And uh, I want to polish this up. I've got some, uh, I'm not sure where it is, but I've got some really great uh, substances. Brasso works very well for this type of thing. We'll clean it up. We may re-blue the blade, depending on how it looks, if there's any pitting, which I am not seeing, which makes me very happy. Um, redo the leather to uh, tighten this up and uh, tighten all this nicely together. I just need to find my screwdriver that fits in there to unscrew this. But cutting and punching leather, while simple, incredibly simple, does a lot to make what we do easier. I'll show you another easier to see example. Now, I'm not sure why there is a white coating on that. That's a little odd. But as you can see, let me... Let me get a pointer of sorts so that you can better see where, where I'm talking. And I need something a little, little... Well, there we go. Okay. Th there is a leather spacer between this... Uh, I believe this is actually a brake pad off of a bicycle um, or a uh, motorcycle. It's a brake off of something. But... Uh, you have that, and because this was a little short, I actually built it up with two layers of leather here that I roughly carved, because that's what I could do. This was a field uh, expediency repair, which means this happened while I was at a list field. Something went boink, and I had to make it go. Now, this uh, handle actually came from a busted pot I got at Goodwill that I bought solely to take the... Uh, the handle off because the handle was it was cheaper to buy a a, a pot at Goodwill than it was to uh, order the ham handle and it was easier than drilling it out myself. I still had to do some adjustments to get everything to fit, but this made for a very functional, well used and well loved weapon. Uh, it does have a. It was showing signs of a bit of an S-curve, and a lot of uh, places and uh, um, groups have actually banned 
the uh, use of parry daggers like this. These are, um, we call them railroad spikes, but they're based on a foil design, but they are very, very rigid. I mean, and that puts a tremendous amount of force on a tip that's half the size of a normal tip. So what I'm thinking is, I'll keep this together as, as a uh, relic of the old days. I'm probably going to um, clean that up and actually stow it because I'd like to save up and possibly get a new cup hilt rapier, possibly new steel cup hilt rapier when I have the hand strength to do it as a uh, fighter because that's been in use for 20 some odd years. And it was old when I got it. Um, it's special to me. And I'm not sure if, if I don't want to put it up and give it the honor it deserves, you know? We'll have to see. But very rudimentary, basic leather working. Basic leather working we're going to talk about when I do this video will be uh, cutting leather, shaping leather, uh, punching leather, which is putting a hole in it. Uh, sewing leather, and probably rudimentary embossing leather. We may get into uh, hardening leather, either via wax or uh, water or oil hardening. There are lots of ways to give you different results of uh, hardness and uh, flexibility in any given leather project. So that will come... I'm not sure when I'm going to do that, Probably not till March, because uh, while it's not directly related to the guild, it does relate to me. In February, uh, February 24th, I will be running a writer's convention, a creator's convention. So writers, artists, uh, fabric artists, uh, fiber artists, a uh, few others, comic book artists, are going to get together. And uh, we're going to make that work. And, you know, people will be able to come to Fowler, Indiana. And at the Purdue, the Purdue University Extension in Fowler, Indiana, also known as the Annex Building, it's right off of 52. It's very easy to get to. Um, we have access to the site from 10 till 10. So, um we are planning to see if we can run that late. If uh, people have to leave early, we'll discuss it. But we will uh, be able to come together and talk about writing and creating, buy each other's books, buy each other's products, uh, build each other up, You know, just encourage and commiserate. So that is definitely coming down the pipe. But because um, Amanda and I are organizing it and running it and paying for it, uh, I'm a little, for the next about seven weeks or so, little swamped. So we will do what we can as we can. This is also the peak of, or will be the peak, of when weather gets dodgy out here. So talking about some of the crafting videos, uh, possibly gorget making, uh, bracer making, um, because these two can highlight a couple really neat techniques and force me to bring out old skill sets that I haven't been working on enough. Um, as part of the crafting our own line, um, because I want you guys to understand, especially if you want to get into steel fencing, that you can make your, your own riggings. What I mean is... I'm not going to grab this again. If you're fencing in a group that allows it, um, most have standards on what, what commercially available blades you use. Standards for safety. Excuse you, sir. That was odd. Anyway, I must have uh, snoozed the alarm. No, and we'll do that. So that has no chance to happen again. Goodbye, sir. But 
Uh, this this whole rigging, with the exception of this, this was a commercially available sport fencing rig, was basically handmade. Uh, the old uh, handle needed to be replaced, so I replaced it, and then I wrapped it with a specific type of grip tape that was blue and very grippy, and it's been rubbed black through use. Uh, John Miner of Swack Hammer Metals actually brazed the uh, brass cross piece. It, it used to have a cold uh, a, a steel one, mild steel one, but it was rather heavy and it threw the bounce off. This is much better. And the triple dust uh, knuckle duster, which looks like it's taken a hit or two, uh, has, has saved my bacon more times than I can count. I love my quillions. Yes, I know they're they're often referred to as keons, but um, I heard quillion it latched in. They make it happen. This is for me the optimum logical uh, fencing sword rigging, and the reason for it is I there are what riggings that have much more protection, um, and I do love them. I could. I don't want to destabilize my my thing, but I'll I'll show you that in a while. However, this gives great protection when presented. I mean, this is almost as big as my buckler, so this basically turns it into a targe with a really bad attitude. Still open enough that I can switch hands mid fight, mid bout as needed. If either I lose my hand or I'm fighting with one weapon. And I've, I've engaged, settled the problem over here. I can transfer to settle a problem over here. Remember, there are two types of blade transfer. One type of blade transfer is when you have parried with one weapon. So let's say, I'm, let me see if I can arm you guys. It's been a while, huh? I need to make a new rig to arm you guys. That, that may be on my to-build list. But... If I, if you've th gone to stab me, excuse me, and I have caught here, and what I, but you were far enough away, I can't hit you. If I catch with my dagger to open up and, and take the shot, okay, that was very sloppy transfer due to the way I'm sitting, but. That is a blade transfer, and that I have transferred your blade from one weapon or defensive object to another weapon or defensive object. Okay. Give me a second. I need to free up some hands. There we go. Here we go. Now, that being said, if I am fencing and for whatever reason I find it advantageous, to switch hands, and I've given reasons for it before, um, that is another type of blade transfer. They're both called blade transfers, but you need uh, you need to look at it in context. Because this is open to the back, I, I can loop slightly under, and with a little practice, easily switch hands. Uh, many open rigs or minimalist rigs, you can do that all day. Um, when you think of the traditional rig, uh, rigging on a small sword, it's a very flat, nearly flat disc suspended, and then there are the two uh, quillions, if they're there. They may be cut off just by the uh, crossbar to give you a proper uh, keyhole grip, okay? Now, the problem with that is it's still very open to the top of the hand. And I got hit there a lot when I was having to do with parries, especially in melee situations. So this gives great coverage for that. I can still get two fingers up in there if I really want to kind of choke up and have extra strength because my hand is feeling weak that day and the nerves may be problematic. It's tight, but it's something I can do. And when I have that, I can very easily control the weapon. I can very easily move it around. I can very easily do a lot of things because I can use the leverage. It almost becomes like a pistol grip uh, fencing foil. 
However, if I have a, I've seen, let me see, I've seen rigs where the, uh, where you come in from the side and it wraps fully. Do you mind, sir? Thank you. It, you know, it wraps fully like a, um, an ale knife or uh, a Scottish broadsword where um, Highland broadsword, sometimes you hear them called, with where they have the sideways cup that fits like this and the blade is running here, but it's fully circular. Great protection. But it becomes very problematic to uh, to to transfer between your blades. Finding that that balance point is something it took a long chunk of history to pull off. And I hate to say it, but if you look at the last rapiers really developed before they to because rapiers kind of got developed to an extreme where you, you, you have the Spanish cup hilt rapier. And then it, you know, the length of the Spanish we weapon, which fed into the Spanish system, became a little problematic. So the weapons got a little smaller and pulled down into the small sword, which, you know, there, there's some debate on... Uh, whether the small sword uh it's sort of it's sort of like humans and orangutans uh similar route to to rapiers but parallel development it's very strange in the small sword rapier side sword family of weapons because a lot of people during that period favored certain blades and certain sword uh certain riggings and they would just mix and match to get what they wanted for their personal equipment remember this is still at a time where not all weapons were uh necessarily uh universally uh standardized for a given military unit or a given uh organization a lot of it was bring your own and a lot of officers at that time they were given an amount of money to, to go towards their commission go go towards their their personal weapon their uh sidearm and uh depending on the background of the officer depending on the wealth of the officer and depending on the preference of the officer all the way up, i mean we're going way into the napoleonic era even uh that you may find uh, customized weapons. That's where you get strange things like spadroons popped up. Sorry, guys, got a little dehydrated today. Still working on that. And, um, excuse me. So, as weapons evolved, you looked for what worked consistently. And it's a neat thing because the people who survived the encounters usually had a fairly reasonable margin of solid protection at the front and at least a knuckle bow and the weapon was fit to them. It was comfortable. Um, the, the great debate becomes historically and it usually was a matter of economics what weapon you were trained in. So if you came up through the ranks and a few people managed to kind of maverick their way up into officerdom, it's, it was very rare, but it did happen compared to the people who simply bought their um, commission. Well, if you came up from the ranks, you were taught saber because saber is something that can be taught very quickly compared to rapier. It can be learned very easy because it's a simpler system and it's gross natural attacks. Uh, so major cuts. Uh, whereas many of the officers who came down from the aristocrat class were not trained both physically and uh, 
technically in Saber. So they needed a lighter weapon that handled like what they knew or as close as could be managed. Uh, this gives you, you have to look up, and they did learn classical fencing with a foil. Okay. Groovy. So what would they try to make was a fighting weapon uh, almost more reverse engineered from a foil that could be used in a in period combat against things like sabers and bayonets. We need to remember that at no no major conflict in history, to the best of my knowledge, has not involved some type of spear. Now, I consider a fixed bayonet to be a, a type of spear because what you have turned your uh, firearm into is a handle of various lengths with a pointed part at the end. That is the definition of a basic spear. So they needed something fairly stout, but light enough and straight with a grip that felt familiar, and the spadroon was born. It's an interesting weapon. It's an interesting adaption that didn't do quite as well as it could have because it tried to be a lot of things instead of being good at one thing. And in weapons, occasionally overgeneralization can be as deadly as overspecification. Not always, but occasionally. This would be one of those occasions. And it's why uh, military sabers were popular. What, I mean, to the 1800s, the, the Marines still have them. Uh, mostly, mostly they are considered uh, ceremonial. I say mostly because they are Marines. And Marines, t as a cu culture, tend to like their knives long and short. Uh, there is, of course, an exception. While it's technically a knife, the, I want to say the gintongs, I mispronounce it, but it's much like a kukri. Um, it's sort of like a kukri and a machete made love uh, would result in one of these that are taught by, to the Filipino Marines, the Marines who were sent, sent to the Philippines. Again, to the best of my knowledge, and at any point, I, I will gladly accept a uh, correction from an educated source, uh, they are um, still taught to use these things. And they are long enough that any normal person would look at them and call them swords. But because of the stipulations of the Marine Corps' dress, uniforms, etc., uh, you know, who can and can't carry a sword, uh, they are considered knives. And you know I do love when uh, laws are followed to the letter to uh, avoid following the spirit of the law, and you get things like the Gintung, or you get Messers, because, well, we're going to ban swords for, for the people, but they can have their knives. And so as long as it had a hilt that was like a knife with two scales on it, well, then it's a knife. Enter the Messers, which just basically means a knife. The Kriegmesser, which is a big knife. Um, delightful things that bring joy to my my black little uh, vaguely Germanic Luxembourgese heart. So, I know we've kind of gone on this journey, but looking at the way rigging's work for effectiveness, the modern sabers uh, very much have, uh, and the hilts that you see, have narrowed to basically just a a small, if at all, guard and, an, and a knuckle guard. That's what you'll basically see on the Marine Corps Sabre. Sometimes they have a minimalist guard. Interestingly, they got rid of the uh, cross piece to give a keyhole grip. I find that to be a major failing, but I think that has to do with uh, leverage and fear of breaking a finger. I'm not sure. It's a strange thing. I know Pat, I think Pat had some things to say about it in his book. Where is that? Uh, 
Anyway, uh, because Patton designed one of the last army sabers. Yes, that Patton, George S. Uh, in his youth, accomplished swordsman, talented sword designer, brilliant tactician, horrible, horrible general for the troops because he saw troops as essentially dis disposable. Which is not something the troops who are being disposed of tend to like. At least according to uh, my grandfather. And since he got a brown star at the Battle of the Bulge, I will hold his uh, historical perspective in high esteem. But uh, let's go to your comments for a bit, because I've been kind of just rolling straight on. And we will see what we have. That way people don't think I'm ignoring them or missing out. Let's see. We mentioned the uh, Historical Fencing Guild YouTube channel. We, uh, I've talked about my books, Amazon.com slash store slash Mr. Nicholas Anthony Talker, the second. Thesis is promoting his show tomorrow night at 530 Mountain Time. Uh, you'll have to do the math yourself because it is after 8. And I do not like to math after 8 o'clock. And our dear friend Cindy Kep is promoting the uh, Bladed Thesis' YouTube. That's Bladed Thesis. The E in Thesis is a 3 for those who are listening and not um, partaking, not watching. And if you want to know and support me, the patreon.com slash the historical fencing guild, Plus, you can still get tickets for the 50-50 raffle for uh, Shadow Fist, Kung Fu, and Tai Chi. They're doing that to uh, raise money to send a competition team, including Cindy, to uh, Florida to compete in a, a martial arts competition. I think it's a wonderful thing if you have the funds and are willing to um, do that. Not only do you have a chance of... Uh, well, not only do you have a chance of winning, which is nice, but you're going to help some good people, and I think that's really cool. We're joined by Miss Saren. Hello, Miss Saren. It is always lovely to see you. And it's hi, Miss Saren. And Foxy says, I'm here, but researching things, and maybe hit and miss. Fascinating. I'd love to know what you're researching. Miss Saren says, hi, Foxy. I'm similarly distracted. That happens. It's a good time for research. Cindy says, be here or be square, because you're not around. I love that old joke. Foxy says, it's time to change up my hairstyle. Just not sure yet. Well, are you thinking color or cut? And um, what you want to do with it? You know, what haven't you done? It should be empowering. And, you know, make you feel good. Uh, you need a PVC mannequin. I need something a little... Yeah, possibly. A PVC mannequin might be the way to go. Um, but I, what I want is a rig so that I can have the stick. I used to have a light dowel rod. I have to find it again on a boom of some sort that I can easily have come right across by the camera because I've been told a lot of people like being able to see that, uh, POV of what you're actually doing with at least the blade. Um, and yes, I'm certain Johnny, if he's around, is going to say something about the um, me with a mannequin. And I just accept that to be in his bailiwick. Ooh, I haven't gotten to use that word in a while. It always feels good when I do. Let's see. Thesis says, and I'm trying really hard not to overthink because I attempt something I haven't done in 25 years, writing my own music for a channel ad. Breathe. It's it's just art. It's all art. Music is art. Art is art. Literature is art. It should flow naturally from you. If you try to force it or you try to limit it too much, it will all just fizzle. Let it happen. Uh, Degrassi had that. You parry an incoming thrust with your sword, transfer it to your dagger, then step in and use the sword to slash the opponent across the face thrust, uh, face, throat, chest, then stab them with the sword. Yes! Um, I am a huge proponent for the glory of um, a good draw cut. A good draw cut is a beautiful thing. 
when you have the reach to pull it off. Uh, it can be the basis of your style if you are significantly long-limbed enough. I know John Miner, um, when we were working on adapting his style for fencing, because I didn't teach him to fence per se. I taught him some of the rules. But what, what I did is help him craft what he could already do and um, adapt it to the fencing uh, conventions, the, the rules of defense, and understanding things like that. Let's see. Johnny says, what if you reverse grip the rapier to intimidate the enemy? How do I transfer it then? All right. Um, assuming reverse gripping a rapier to int intimidate an enemy is not going to intimidate an enemy, they're going to see that as either you're stupid or unprepared, and uh, it does invite a s sudden brutal stabbing. However, if we are using something like Batu technique with the rapier, um, you still can, and actually I have, because you're you've gone from a draw and perhaps something went wrong, you have, you, know, you have your sword sheath per right hand draw. One moment here. I need a little lower range. Here. And the sheath. Is that the sheath? Yes, it is. Okay. This is my sheath, which canes as well. So we've got it sheathed, right? Now, assuming this hand is otherwise occupied, but since I don't have a uh, frog and belt on will have it will have to hold to allow me to unsheath. If you have unsheathed your weapon right-handed in some type of block, which can happen with a minimalist guard, you pull it up, block, you might be able to get a set and reverse draw cut. They happen. Um, I have seen uh, them used for wide line parries because something's gone wrong. It actually sets up for a very natural uh Blade transition. So if you are doing something like this, um, especially if it's at, with a weapon that might be on the shorter side of a sword, uh, 24 to 30 some odd inches, so take about six inches off this guy here, you get in some, a range I find very comfortable. And you, you've parried, you've used this in, in what I would refer to as a tanto technique, where Hopefully, if this is double-edged, you actually have the flat of the blade against your uh, forearm, or you're doing cut. You're still not going to do a lot of damage to yourself because it's going to take a uh, surface kind of side-to-side -side shape. You may scrape more than actually lacerate yourself, um, you know, which is comparative, because it's not doing the uh, edge cut. But you come in close and follow right th back through. That is a totally natural, totally standard way to uh, deal with that actual issue. If you have to go from a reverse grip, which things like that happen. They happen when you're thinking in terms of bar fights. People don't think about the steps from I am not in a fighting stance. I am not in a fighting guard. I am not ready to engage the enemy to sudden threat self-defense because these these were weapons of self-defense in some places and certain variants they were on the battlefield and that's well and good but at the end of the day they were most often weapons of civilian self-defense and you had to be able to know when to deploy them how to deploy them but you also have to remember that if your hand touched your weapon in some cities, that could be considered brandishing and you die. You get thrown in jail and then killed because brandishing a weapon, like having, like having it pulled out, legally is the same as putting your hand, go think about your life, think about your choices. That's part of the reason that you will see... Um, what is affectionately referred to, and pardon the, the pun, because this comes from the uh, romance novel vernacular of you've got a blade rigged 
and they're the hands are not touching it, but it's sort of you're hanging it and you're just sort of got your arm propped on it. This is a the so called slutty uh, hand on the hilt thing. This is a very popular trope in art and things, but because usually it's stopping at the forearm, your hand, you're not grabbing the weapon, you're just resting it at the end until you have to. I don't know if Johnny expected that question to be answered uh, honestly, but there you go. And we have, with much difficulty, I think he saw me, uh, referring to the, uh, how do you transfer? You're tra if you're doing a per hand blade transfer where you're just swapping, it goes through. If you've blocked like that, okay, you pull your dagger, go up here, and then go for, for a draw cut under. It's a reverse hand, but still a draw cut motion. Hydration is good. You can't... You can't ignore me, only be stunned by my greatness. I was not ignoring you, sir. I was looking to answer your question. Uh, LOL, Johnny, you are certainly one of, surely one of a kind. Fortunately or not, they broke the mold after they made me. Miss Saren is thinking of multiple Johnnies, and that is a green room thought, and we're going to just walk away. Literally, mom, mom, oh, okay. Sure is, Saren. Hanada told, told uh, Naruto the same thing. Wow. Haven't seen that anime, so I have no idea what you're talking about. Meaning he can multiply himself at will. We're a re weird group for sure. Yes, we are, but I love you guys anyway. Uh, Johnny, you should be proud of me. I made quite the joke during the morning show, but Nick's net was being a button to leave my comment. I'm so sorry about that. My net was being terrible for the show. He had a green room moment. Thesis, I appreciate you keeping the environment at that level. But I'll look so good with the reverse grip rapier. The, I'm sure they'll back away after. No. One, if if you are putting... To, to have a functioning reverse grip on your rapier, it's going to have to be minimalist. Uh, and two, rapier fighting really, guys... A lot of rapier fighting is far closer to, uh, you know, uh, gunfights, uh, Wild West gunfights. The first one to get their blade out and in the other guy often wins. I mean, really often. And let's see. The pommel can be sharp and pointy, so that can be used to... Now, that... Okay. Sharp and pointy is not good for anything that's standard, both talking... Both, you know, exposed and uh, not... Uh, and potentially pointed at yourself in a press. No, 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 no. However, I love both good pommel strikes. So... Going from the draw and following through because they're they you are in a very bad situation. They've managed to get in very close, and you know at that moment until you throw the sheath back to get the draw, you may not be able to clear the business end of the sword, which is fine. So you just angle and aim very quickly, and you draw, and you just kind of rack them a couple times with the pommel to buy space then you can get your blade out and engage. But, because pommel strikes are great. Also, pommel parries. I'm notorious for parrying with the back of the blade because I was so much shorter than many of my opponents. I needed that extra couple inches to get inside their um, range of attack. Nick mentioned that he plays large, longer ads so that he can go to the bathroom or grab a snack. I said, I'm sure Amanda appreciates being called a snack, but you need a much longer to do... Uh, you need a much longer ad to do that properly. One, Amanda's not a snack. She's the whole dang meal. Two, um, absolutely. And three, I wouldn't do that while streaming. I have uh, some standards in my behavior. LL, making sure to get to it this time, eh? And Jai says, that's both 
clever and timely. I couldn't have done it better myself. At the Spouse and uh, Foxy is waiting with popcorn for him to get to that comment. I got it, Foxy. Wait, I misread that. Nora said, offers popcorn to everyone. Please stop talking about popcorn. Uh, my my big tin is empty, and I am in post-Christmas popcorn withdrawal. Uh, no worries. Thanks for the popcorn, though. And I got cream room for the first time. Is it weird that I'm a little proud of myself? <laughs> we all are for our first time. You, you are doing very well, and I, I am proud. You have to, it means you're being comfortable. You should always be proud to be green room. It is, I don't know what kind of bad influences you've been dealing with, one of life's great mysteries. All right. So, there is something I wanted to talk about, and I was hoping that Trelana would be in the chat, but if she's not, I will try to remember to point this out to her later. Um, One moment. I need to move this to a new window. I need to then move this to a new screen. Haha. -ha. And I can do th this. Now, there is a dust, a, a, there, he's calling it a Meyer Dusk trainer. I'm on a Purple Heart Armory site, but it has a couple inches longer than the standard Meyer. That's very nice. I think uh, I think it's a good opportunity for some people to get the the slightly longer. But he's not telling me blade length, and that does bother me. But I'm going to mention that Trelane. I believe thirty five is a decent price for that. Now, um, I've been told I focus a little bit too much. On the oh yes, hold on. Where are we? Here we. There we are. I'm sorry. Uh, finding my cursor across two screens can be challenging. Uh, let's see. Eddie caught up. We're slacking. Yes, we are. Talky meat, and that's an impressively uh, sized sewing needle, and it does look like a sewing needle. Dussics are amazing weapons. Uh, they have an agricultural root in that they are very, very simple to forge comparatively. Um, they can be made from adjusting uh, scythes. They can be, they were made as a, a machete-like implement in the European Middle Ages. Uh, they're, they give hand protection. Again, they're inexpensive. One can mass produce them with blacksmiths who aren't necessarily the highest grade of weaponsmiths. You know, convert a blacksmith and a bladesmith are two different things. And yes, they really do look like sewing needles. So they are delightful for uh, uh, the idea of a shrunken character. If you ever worry about being shrunk, you train with one of these, you know how to use a sewing needle as a sword then. Feel free to laugh at that. It was something I was really concerned about when I was a very small child. And these antibiotics cause burps that taste the way roses smell. I am not sure woo, how to respond to that. I will say any burps I've been engaged with lately, and I have been quite a few, have not smelled or tasted that way, but uh, so what I want to go through is some. Let's see, yes, rebated steel leaf. Well, I want to see if this. Okay, no, it's not there anymore. Uh, we can look into weapons that are not uh, the basic weapons. And we can go by either guard or we can go by type. Now, I do tend to lean towards the synthetics because they're inexpensive relative, they're quality, and they make the police less skittish. We live in an era where understanding uh, making the police less skittish is a good thing. We also have uh, weapons of different cultures. So if we go into 
uh, Japanese weapons, for example, the V2 uh, Odachi, Nodachi Odachi, I have a second of a V1. If you wanted a truly weeb friendly, if you want the Sephiroth fence sword to train with, this is what you get. It is fabulous. And with the amount of uh, hilt, you have the leverage to power the weapon um, you know, two-handed. Now, there's a lot of arm-crossing positions that you have to deal with. It takes time, space, and energy to work with. But it's a very good weapon. Uh, to give you the scale, that is with a gentleman a little taller than me. I do, I go, I have no problem recommending that. What is it? A, uh, yeah, it's a 40 inch blade, but it's got, uh, it's 55 overall. So it's got 15 inches of hilt. It makes it for a very surprisingly comfortable experience, but again, higher end. And, uh, let's see. Another interesting thing, I th I think the wooden Naganadas at 110, frankly, to me, feel overpriced. Uh, they, they give you a picture of front and back, so they are 65 inches, 5.5 five in length. I, I'm not sure about the wood weapons. Uh, it just, it's something I'm a little uneasy about, but there are videos about how to use them quality commentary there uh but like i said i'm trying to cover um oh i have to check this out 23 inches long the suka is nine inches oh i like that i quite like that friends uh, I am short enough that modern Wakazashis fit much like uh, um, modern uh, katanas fit taller people. And let's see. Fancy, fancy Vulcans. Look at that's a club. Those are clubs, basically. And of course, the, the V4. Oh, I see two things I have to look at. The V4 Katana, the size is what, 30? Blade, 29, yeah, so just under 30 inches. The hand, so it's overall 42, which means it's a 12-inch grip. Again, very nice, simple weapons. But these are the higher end. Now, I am fascinated to see a Flex Steel Katana. But I just saw what I needed to know. It is not tipped, and that makes me makes me sad. Although the purple is fabulous, uh, light flex. I would oh, that's intriguing. I would love to see something like that, but with a uh, um, really. It passes SCA. That's fascinating. I, I'm going to have to check um, about that. That's what I'll have to look into and possibly send towards uh, John. So, yes, I may have to send that material towards John to share around. Because that is fascinating. I'd like to know more. Now, uh, it reminds me of something that I can't put my finger on. Though not good with when mixed with candy cane mint, though. Oh, you could make one cheaper than that. Yes. I like the crowbar. Might make my cousin 
a, a Jason Todd for practice. Well, um, I used to train with a crowbar. I used to have a, about a three-foot-long crowbar that I did my sword drills with. I don't know how, why I damaged my arms, but back in the day when I was doing strength training to be able to hold up to the parries that some of the heavy fighters were throwing, I did that. Um, before the crowbar, close to strength at home. You know, it's just a thing. However, um, I just wanted to show some of the different uh, weapons that were available, and I'm trying to see what is available, because I have to check up on this every so often for um, my dear viewers, because many of you have West uh, Eastern tendencies. So if I bring this back, well, let me see. They do have, let me get over here, a few, uh, base, two, two variants of gin trainers at the sub-50 style, uh, sub-50 price. I'm very happy to see that. Uh, because with shipping, it can get a little pricey. The Dow trainer is actually quite nice. And I would like to see a synthetic Dow, but he hasn't done a proper synthetic Dow. This is on my personal potential order list because it looks tempting. Uh, I just, I, I don't know. I need to know, and this is more from the Patreon folks, what um, what weapons, let me, let me see, can I do this? There we go. That looks ominous, but what weapons would you, uh, weapon trainers, uh, when I refer to weapons, I always mean uh, training weapons for the purpose of this program. I hope that YouTube understands that. Um, would you like me to review? What are you interested in seeing practically handled and reviewed so we can uh, go about making sure, you know, I buy stuff so you don't have to sometimes. And, you know, on, I know there there have been requests for the LK Chen uh, trainers, but frankly, I can't afford to send that kind of money out on something like that when with that kind of money I could outfit, you know, let's see, $300, I could almost outfit head-to-toe armor and weapons for two people. Probably more, depending on how flexible I'm being with the requirements. Or get trainers for almost 10, depending on what kind of trainer I'm using. So I have to always keep these things in balance. But please, especially the Patreon folks, let me know what you want to see reviewed. And if it's reasonable, especially if it's around that $50 range, I may try to make that happen. Okay? But we're getting into the last couple minutes of our hour together. Um, I want to thank you guys for all the wonderful stuff you did to make 2023 such a great year for the Historical Fencing Guild. And for this channel, I want to thank all of you because everybody here has been on my other channel, um, youtube.com slash at Nicholas Talker, where I do artwork and uh, literary support and a few other things. I want to remember to shout out and uh, our good friend Cindy has been putting links in the chat, including my, my books again, my art again. The Patreon, please. This is the big winner. And uh, thesis tomorrow night is live streaming. If you have the means to do so, please do so. And go over to, to um, at Bladed Thesis with the second E being a three. And uh, subscribe there. After, of course, I hope you've subscribed here. And please put a like on this. If you don't like what I am doing, please feel free to comment with uh, your comments, your questions, whatever helps you to uh, 
do do what we do. And Foxy's reminding us all to not forget to like and all that jazz. So it'll be 7.30 Eastern. I need to write that down, and I'm out of... I looked at the Post-it notes today. <clears throat> I, I have more Post-it notes. I just have to find them. But... T-House... At bladed thesis seven thirty Saturday. I am going to try. I can't make a uh, a promise, but there you go. I will try. I've made a note for myself, and it will depend. My Saturday evenings tend to be family time, and we're usually playing a game together or doing something, but we will see. And uh, a Ryu Jin or Dao trainer would be interesting. I am tempted because I've handled Live Steel Jin. I've handled uh, Wooden Jin trainers. I have one downstairs I got in Chinatown, uh, Chicago's Chinatown. Uh, haven't handled their synthetics and that their their basics might not be a bad uh object to train with i'm also again really tempted by by the dows so we may see we may just have to see on that one but uh we will keep uh looking into that and if you have any other weapons or trainers you're looking for uh i that reminds me i have to do um i have to uh check into a very specific trainer that i want to see if i can't send to somebody but um with that guys fuck okay we've got a couple more comments and foxy says figure lot lots lost lots of folks have trouble with time zones, so I would put it out there. I greatly appreciate it because I am one who loses track, especially since I'm right on the edge of a time zone. I'm, I'm forever traveling in time. And uh, Miss Heron says, sweet, subbed, and I'll try to stop by before the D&D &D game. We appreciate that. He's doing an AMA, so it should be anything. Hydrate and snack yourself, Nick. Uh Literally, as soon as I click end stream, dear. Say goodnight, Gracie, and thanks, Miss Saren. Good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. But, um, guys, you know how it is. Keep your guard up. Keep your eyes open. Be kind to yourself and each other. And as always, thank you for supporting your local Swordmaster. I will be back next week at 8 p.m. on Friday night to edu edutain <laughs> you lovely bunch. And uh, with that, We'll see you all very soon. Toodles.